So it's my great pleasure to be here with Debraj Ray. Uh, as you know, this his work has been seminal to this unit we've talked about on nutrition. And he's also the author of this wonderful book I recommend to all of you, the seminal textbook in development economics. Thank you, Debraj, for joining us. Sure. Pleasure. Uh, so oh, I, we just, I just wanted to take you back to the time when you did this work on nutrition-based poverty traps. Sure. What made you think of it? Why, why, did, why did that idea jump out at you? Why, what made you work on it? All right. Uh, so I was a young assistant professor at Stanford, and I was um, sort of captivated by this question of why, why do we see so much undernutrition in the world around us uh, when, when aggregate food production seems to be uh, good enough? Um, uh, and there was something clearly wrong about the way in which market prices or market forces were adjusting so as to bring a physiological need, which was the need for an adequate amount of nutrition, into balance with, with what was available, what, was, what, what it was possible to buy. And this was compounded by the fact that, you know, we were, we were talking about actual food production being enough. If you think about potential food production, so for example, if food output, uh, if all food was produced as efficiently as Dutch farms in all the arable land of the world, right, uh, you'd produce enough food to feed 70 billion people. Uh, that's a, that, that you know. So, but leaving out just capacity, just actual food production was enough. So, so I wanted to think of uh, writing down a theory in which there would be two, uh, two things that were combined. One is that somehow the high inequality in society is siphoning away some of that available surplus in other forms, which I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, the second part would be. Uh, the, re the residual, that's what's available for, for, for everybody else, is somehow not being allocated efficiently by the market. So basically, you know, um, inequality had to be at the heart of this. So the, the two sides, okay, so one side and its flip side. So one side was that um, the rich actually consume an enormous amount of food. Now, this is not true in terms of the quantity of food, mm. but in the way they consume it. So, uh, for instance, if you look at all the, at the time, I actually looked back at the data when I, was, uh, when I was working on my stuff. If you look at the total amount of food grain given as animal feed, right, in all the developed countries, it was, at the beginning of the 80s, around 370 million tons, which is more than the total consumption of food grain in India and China combined at the time. So, uh, so, so the amount of... Uh, food grain that goes into animal feed is uh, is a lot and animals eat a lot like a chicken will eat about 35 kilograms a year right and a human being needs about the equivalent of 200 to 220 kilograms of, uh, of, of wheat so chickens may be very tasty but it's an inefficient way of, of providing nutrition right I see. So um, this is an argument for vegetarianism? No, it's not <laughs> an argument for vegetarianism. Well, you know, it's a, but the fact of the matter is that there is a lot, I mean, uh, it's, uh, so in this parable, in this little nutritional parable, which I'm going to extend later on, right? In this little parable, there's a, there's a limited surplus of something. Part of it is getting dragged away. In, in, in this example, in the form of chickens, right? But, but it, it'll be dragged away in the form of other things uh, later on. And the remaining surplus has to get allocated. So, so I, I was sort of intrigued by this idea. And it was, uh, it, went, it took me back to this old uh, school of the French physiocrats, right? Which talked about how agrarian surplus limited the, uh, the ability of a society to sustain a non-agrarian labor force, right? And it was uh, really brought into economics by the work of, let's see, uh, Rania Nurkse, uh, Arthur Lewis, uh, Mikhail Kalechki, people like that who talked about the agrarian surplus as being, not to mention Soviet planning, right, as a constraint on development. But uh, something was unsatisfactory about the notion of uh, the sort of sharp minimum subsistence that was there in the Kalechkin story. It was like you consume one centigram less of food and you'll go off in a puff of smoke, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there's no time to be undernourished in that story. So uh, fortunately, there's a, uh, there's a flip side to this. Um, and the flip side is uh, a, a, another line which comes actually from the Fabian socialists, namely Sidney and Beatrice Webb, who talked a lot about this, uh, and which comes to us in economics through the work of Harvey Leibenstein. 
which has to do with uh, the idea that a better nourished individual is a more productive individual, right? So we are going to replace this abrupt subsistence of Kalechki with something that's smoother, but yet is also uh, uh, susceptible to threshold effects. So there, you know, you, you can't, you know, you can't eat a gram of food every day and, and, and hope to do productive work. So there's a threshold and there you comes your famous S-shaped curve, right? Which describes the relationship between nutrition and work capacity. So, uh, so what I wanted to do was marry this idea to the earlier story that I was telling you about, right? And when I did that, um, uh, something serendipitous actually popped out as a byproduct, which is that, you know, one would have expected that the high amount of inequality, well, then some people siphon away part of the food, and then market prices adjust uh, to give the rest whatever it is that they, that they would need to get to, in order to get the market to clear. Uh, but in... But, but what's interesting about market prices in this context is that they're performing two roles. One is that they want to deliver output in an efficient way. And because of the threshold effects on that S-shaped capacity curve, this actually pins down the wages or the piece rates to individuals who are actually employed mm -hmm. at a fairly healthy level, thereby necessitating that those who are not uh, employed, the people who have to actually face the brunt of the adjustment, uh, face them in a discontinuous and precipitous fashion, right? So that their consumption drops a lot. And that's how you get this sort of uh, large amount of undernutrition, which is linked in turn to the initial inequality. So this is the connection, a connection between the ambient inequality and its outcome, which is, uh, uh, which is this uh, sort of discontinuous uh, um, uh, presence of a large amount of uh, undernutrition and involuntary unemployment. Been a very influential idea in in all of development economics. This sort of it was the kind of the m first proper modern implementation of the S shape. But since then, in your work and others, this idea of S shape and sort of why the poor just don't pull themselves up by their bootstraps uh, has been elaborated and you some of the most interesting stuff is your work on for example on aspirations so is can you tell us a little bit more about how you would sort of broaden that idea of their sure. shape and bring in these ideas sure. that you've been thinking about more recently sure um, um, uh, before I tell you uh, about aspirations and so forth, let me let me just distill in from the you know this nutrition story is only a parable, and it's a parable for an extremely poor society. Okay, and thankfully most societies are not that extremely poor anymore, right? However, there is a um, there is a, there is something we can distill from it. So uh, let's get abstract just for a second. What what were the essential features of the story that I just told you? One was that there's a resource of some sort, okay, uh, which the rich demand in larger quantities than the poor. The second is that this resource affects the capacity of people to produce, yeah, and the this structure of the resource affecting production has this famous S-shaped uh, characteristic. Mm -hmm. So there's threshold mm -hmm. effects, um, and finally, of course, that the resource is limited in supply. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and these three things together precipitate this connection between inequality and the amount of people not having access to the mm -hmm. resource. Now, think about uh, health, right? So health is a wonderful example of a resource that satisfies all these three properties. Uh, think about education. Education is another example of a resource which satisfies all these three properties. Why do you think education or health is scarce? So it's, it seems like it's different from food. Food, you know, there's only so much food we can produce. Education, you might think everybody can be educated. Everybody right. can have good health. So why right. are they similar? Right. So the, uh, let's go back to the example of the world producing uh, everything as the Dutch farms do, mm. in which case they would feed an approximate 70 billion people, right? Mm. Um, why doesn't, well, we don't have to feed 70 billion, we have to feed only six, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, why can't we, uh, why can't the food production just pour in, right? So it's not a question of there's only so much food, it's the question of the market not demanding that food. And that's at the heart of this, uh, uh, this equilibrium story, because the market is actually delivering a certain fraction of the people to be left undernourished in this fashion. Uh, 
So the same is true of education. It's true that we can educate a large number of people, but the market itself is not going to deliver it because a need does not translate into a market demand. Right. So, so um, a final example is I want, I, I want to tell you about is because it's related to the wonderful work that you have done with Andy Newman and also Odette uh, Gellor and uh, Joseph Zaira, which is uh, think of access to capital as a scarce resource, right? Again, it satisfies all three conditions. The rich would love to have more of it. Uh, second, there could be threshold effects in the use of capital. There's no point handing everybody one penny in order to start up a business. And uh, finally, there is, uh, it, it is in limited supply. It has to be allocated. And if you take these, again, these three points, you get a story of occupational choice, uh, let's say the choice between being an entrepreneur or a worker, uh, which runs exactly parallel to the nutrition story. Yeah? And, um, uh, you know, while, uh, of course, what you and uh, Galor and Zaira and Andy Newman have done is you've really taken the details of that story and drawn it out into something very rich. Uh, but I submit to you that the core of those ideas can perhaps be found uh, in, in, in the I'm nutrition so parable. So. You know, if you think about um, uh, theories of poverty or poverty traps, we can think about these things from two, from two entirely different angles. One angle has to do with the notion of what is feasible mm -hmm. or what are people's capacities like. Um, how do those capacities suffer in case of undernutrition or, or ill health or, 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 or lack of education? The other is we can think of the psychology of poverty. So these are two complementary approaches to thinking about poverty. So, uh, so what do we have in the psychology of poverty? Well, um, we may have several things that actually psychologically bind people into a state of poverty. Um, for instance, uh, uh, let's think about the role of aspirations. Right. So imagine a society uh, in which there may be a lot of inequality, but this is a it's a it's it's it's, it's a connected society in the following sense that for every person. There's another person who embodies a milestone that he or she wants to attain, but somebody just tantalizingly ahead of her. Okay. Then that gives you the well, what one might call the milestone theory of economic development. That might give you the incentive uh, to put in the work, to put in the hard yards, just to get to that tantalizing person a bit ahead of you, right? And so on, all the way up the line, right? So you, one can build a, a, a stairway to heaven, if you like, right? But if imagine now another society which is highly polarized in the sense that there is a bunch of people down here and then there's just a desert, okay? And then there's a bunch of very rich people on the other side, right? Now to go from this hump where we have a bunch of people located to the other, uh, there are no milestones in between, right? There's nobody just tantalizingly out of reach. Everybody out there is completely out of reach. Yeah. So as a result, if you want to embark on this journey, you have to embark on climbing many rungs of that ladder with no sense of intermediate satisfaction, right, until you get to the very end. And this is why a highly polarized society or a disconnected society may be inimical to, to investment and growth, uh, whereas a connected society will, 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 will generate that. So that's, that's, that's another example of poverty traps driven by a failure of aspirations.